This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Let's say you're on a boat moving away from the shoreline perpendicular to it, and after one kilometer a very thick fog rolls in making it so you can't see anything. And let's just say you become disoriented or something happens where you don't remember the direction of the shore. All you know is that you're one kilometer away from it. The question is, what's the most efficient way to guaranteed get back to the shore? And by most efficient, I mean the smallest worst case scenario. So whatever method you come up with, find the maximum distance you could drive using it if very unlucky, and that number should be a minimum. Oh, and this ocean is in ideal math land, so you can determine exactly how far you travel when you do. If you want to turn a certain angle, you can do so exactly. And we'll say you have an anchor and long rope, so if you want to move in a perfect circle about some center, then you can do so. Now, okay, this might not be the most applicable example, but we'll get to those. Give yourself like 33 seconds to think this over though, while I say that why we have to learn optimization problems isn't really a mystery. It is true that the average person will not need to know most of this stuff in their daily lives, but a lot of you would probably be surprised just how much our lives are affected by the analysis and understanding of maximums and minimums. And sure, problems like minimum perimeter fences or least expensive cans can have applications, but we're going to get some more motivation here beyond what you're going over in your calc class. Except we're still starting with this more fun, less applicable example, so let's see how that works. For the few people who actually attempted the puzzle, see if you came up with this. First drive one kilometer in whatever direction that you think the shore is. It's possible you hit it, but very unlikely. Then move in a perfect circle in whatever direction around that center point, and you are guaranteed to eventually hit the shore. The worst case scenario here is if we go back to our starting location, you move one kilometer at an infinitely small angle above the horizontal here, barely miss the shore, and move in an entire circle until you hit it. In this case, you drove one kilometer, the radius, plus two pi, essentially the full circumference. Now, this is the method most people commented on Twitter when I posted this question, but this is not the best we can do. We can do something else where the worst case scenario is less than one plus two pi. To show this, I gotta bring the boat closer to the shore. And to summarize the method, we're simply going to drive further in the beginning. I'll say 1.5 kilometers for now, then move along a circle with that longer distance as the radius. What you're seeing here is the worst case scenario, by the way, at least for 1.5 kilometers as that starting distance. Driving that distance in any other direction and then doing a circle will get you to the shore sooner. So whether it's 1.5 kilometers or 2 or 1.4 or whatever, all these circular paths have a larger radius and a longer initial straight line drive than before. But we don't have to drive in a complete circle with this method, only part of one. So the question is, is there some value of d, we'll say, where the worst case scenario path has a length that is less than 1 plus 2 pi? Well, obviously the answer is yes, which is easy to see graphically. The total distance traveled here will simply be d plus the arc, and that arc will have a length of r times theta, where the radius is also d. Then theta is that full angle between the first dash line and this other one I'll add in showing where we'd meet the shore. One of those inner angles would have a value of cosine inverse of 1 over d. So this would be the equation for the total distance traveled in regards to the worst case scenario for any value d. This part here is just r times theta, or 2 pi, the full circle, minus those inner angles. Now if we graph this equation, we get this here. Again, the y-axis is the distance for the worst case scenario path, while the x-axis is d, the length of that first straight line drive. You'll see here at d equals 1, or d equals 1.183 kilometers, the worst case path is 1 plus 2 pi. But anything in between is shorter. And the absolute minimum lies here at 1.04,6.995. So we can drive anywhere between 1 and 1.183 kilometers at first, and then in a circle, and do better than the previous method. But 1.04 kilometers is the actual minimum where you would drive guaranteed 6.995 kilometers or less. And compared to the 1 plus 2 pi, or roughly 7.28 kilometers, you're saving just over a quarter of a kilometer in the worst case scenario. 
So there you go. That's the solution. But I have some bad news. I was so surprised when I read this, but amazingly, we can do better. Yeah, there's an even more efficient method, but I'll leave that to you guys to try to figure out. No, I'm kidding. I'll explain it, but in another video linked below so I can get on with this one. Because now let's see some actual real world applications along with some interesting stories. Let's say you have an Amazon warehouse to be built, which only needs to deliver to three large business locations, A, B, and C. The question is, where's the best place to build the warehouse to minimize the distance that the delivery trucks have to drive? This is assuming an ideal scenario, by the way, of straight line drives to all destinations and back, and also an equal number of drop-offs for each. The school version of this question would be, given a triangle, which point minimizes the total distance to all the vertices, or D1 plus D2 plus D3? That point, wherever it may be, we call the Fermat point, or in some sources I saw it called the Steiner point. Now, do you think that point is located at one of the vertices, like here, since one of those distances would now be zero? This is wrong, but decades ago this configuration was almost designed and it would have cost a certain company a lot of money if it hadn't been corrected. In the 1960s, Bell Telephone Company was tasked with connecting three airports in the United States that were part of Delta Airlines. Due to how pricing worked, the goal was to use the least amount of wire, and what they planned to do was connect airport 1 to 2, then 2 to 3. Now all three are connected, but thinking this would minimize the total length of wire is like saying this is the Fermat point. Delta managed to catch the mistake though. And when it comes to triangles where the largest angle is less than 120 degrees, like this, there's an easy solution to find the desired point. All you gotta do is draw two equilateral triangles connected to two of the sides, as shown. Then you just connect the unshared corners to the opposite vertex, and the intersection is the Fermat point. Placing kind of a dummy hub here to link all the wires together and minimize those distances, Delta saved 15.5% on the bill that came with this setup. This concept is useful in regards to something called facility location problems or location analysis, which is of course all about where to place facilities like hospitals, fire departments, or warehouses in order to optimize whatever, travel distance, cost, efficiency, etc. If you like the last example, another similar one would be that of the smallest circle problem. The question is, if you have a set of points, what's the smallest radius circle you could draw that contains all of them? And yes, points are allowed to be on that circle. It turns out that it only takes, at most, three points, shown in red, to determine this circle. Adding more points to the interior doesn't change anything. If I move some of the points around, then we see that the three points which define the circle do change. And it is possible for two points to define the circle, and when that happens, the points will guaranteed be on opposite ends of the diameter. Now the longest distance between any two points in our dataset is known as the geometric span of the set of points. And it turns out that the spanning circle will guaranteed have a radius that is less than or equal to that value over root 3, or about 0.577d. The actual maximum of d over root 3 happens, in this case for example, when the outer points form an equilateral triangle. Here the greatest distance between two points is just one of the sides, and the radius of this circle is that value over root 3. Now the reason this has applications in facility planning is because, for example, placing a hospital in the center of that circle can minimize the maximum distance an ambulance would need to travel if we assume the points are all people's homes. Sometimes this is also called the bomb problem though, because if the points are considered targets, then a bomb placed in the center of that circle can lead to maximum damage, and the radius has to do with the required explosive force. And that's not the only military-related example in this video. Seemingly unrelated, in 1686 a math problem was solved related to basketball. The question that was answered was essentially, what's the minimum initial velocity you could shoot a basketball and still make the shot. This is assuming you're given the shot location and any heights that you need. The derivation is doable, but a little too long for a video like this. But it has to be solved as a function of vertical distance from release height to the hoop, as well as horizontal distance from the hoop, as those will determine the minimum velocity for the shot to go in. However, even if you find that velocity, it might not be valid, 
because that speed might correspond to the shot that goes up through the bottom, which isn't a legitimate shot in basketball. So you gotta check that dy dt is negative at this point, aka it's gotta go down through the hoop. Now it turns out that if you want to put in the least amount of energy to shoot the basketball from any distance, just find the right triangle between your release and the hoop as shown, then take that angle of elevation I'll call alpha, add 90 and divide by 2. That is your release angle. So for an average height male shooting from the free throw line, not granny style like this animation, then the resultant angle is roughly 52.4 degrees. This is not the minimum angle, it's just the angle needed for the minimum velocity. The actual velocity, squared in this case, is found with this expression here. So plugging in the numbers for a standard court, we get a speed of 7.62 meters per second. I simulated this with Desmos, and here you'll see with those values the ball will go down through the center of the hoop, but if I lower the initial velocity by any amount, then regardless of the angle, it won't make it to that center point, meaning 7.62 was our minimum. Now, I said that this was discovered in the 1600s, but the thing is, basketball wasn't even invented back then. There was actually a different, more applicable reason this paper was published, and it had to do with firing cannonballs. The goal from the original paper seemed to be concerned with finding the minimum velocity you could shoot a cannonball at, and thus use minimum powder, and still have it get up onto a target, or hit it from above, just like a basketball landing in a hoop. This minimal velocity and associated angle would save money and resources with regards to the powder while ensuring the target is still hit. And on top of all this, that specific angle that goes with the minimum velocity, I'll call it alpha still, has a cool property. If you find the horizontal length a projectile will travel as a function of theta, it turns out dld theta at alpha equals zero. Thus dl equals zero d theta. Meaning, if you have a very small error in the angle or some d theta, yes it's exaggerated here, you'll have virtually no error in the horizontal distance travel, you'll still hit your target. This relates to error of propagation for you Calc 1 students, but overall we can afford some human error in the angle of the cannon while maintaining an accurate shot. Now, here's an entirely different category of optimization problems that's probably the easiest to find applications for. Let's go back to our airport example, but this time assume there are several of them that are separated by these distances. I know this doesn't show the distance between every hypothetical airport, but let's assume only these connections are even possible. Anyways, the goal is to link all these together using the least amount of wire. So, I mean, we could connect everything together like this, but of course that's not a minimum. Because if we remove any connection, we still have all airlines connected, but have used less wire. Yes, connected simply means you can get from one airport to another via the wires. Well, the actual configuration with the least cost is known as the minimum spanning tree. This is a tree as it's connected and has no cycles. Plus, it has the minimum weight of any tree we could draw that connects all the points. Minimum spanning trees have applications in designing various types of networks, simply where many things need to be connected efficiently. It applies in computer vision and image processing, and let's just say several other things. This is just one example in discrete math, or more specifically combinatorial optimization, where there's a finite number of possibilities. And in a sense, these are very easy, because we could, in this case, just find every single spanning tree and then pick the smallest one. Or with a traveling salesperson, if I were given a list of cities and had to find the fastest route that visits each city once and returns to the original, I could just try every possible permutation and pick the fastest one. The problem is that these kinds of questions become so time-consuming to do by brute force that in this case, after hundreds and definitely thousands of cities, even the fastest supercomputers can't brute force it in a lifetime. So we have to find algorithms that either find the exact solution much faster, or can get us an approximate answer in a reasonable amount of time. Something known as Dijkstra's algorithm finds the shortest path between two nodes in a network, and this is the basis for how Google Maps and GPS routing works. It's also heavily used in routing computer networks, so without algorithms like this, internet speed and communication would slow down. 
This kind of math is so important that new technology beyond just better computers is being built to solve these problems. As an example, I came across a few articles on something known as an optical icing machine that might be able to use lasers to solve optimization problems. I'll link this below for those who want to read a more detailed explanation. But hopefully you realize that without the study of optimization, our world would be drastically different. Oh, and by the way, there's like one or two other optimization types I didn't get to, but I only had so much time for this video. If you'd like to continue to optimize your learning though, God, that was terrible, you can do so over at CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a platform that hosts thousands of documentaries, but one I've mentioned before that just goes well with this video is Codebreaker, because it's also a story of mathematics being used in the real world, specifically with encryption during World War II. Most of you probably have heard of Alan Turing, but there were many more people involved in this, and this film takes you through the story of how someone named Bill Tutt pulled off what some describe as one of the greatest intellectual feats of World War II. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. Plus, if you go to curiositystream.com slash Zachstar or click the link below and use the promo code Zachstar, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in just giving it a try. This gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series that I know many of you will find very interesting. So again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.